Greetings and salutations, everyone. My name is Andrew Kirkhoff, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, I'm going to be talking about my top 40 running back rankings for week one of the 2024 fantasy football season. Now, over the course of today's episode, I'm going to be talking about each individual player by sharing with you guys my thought process and opinions while also presenting statistics that I've gathered that justify the reasons as to why we are starting these players in week one. Yes, week one is just a couple days away. The kickoff of the 2024 NFL season begins on Thursday night as the Kansas City Chiefs take on the Baltimore Ravens, and we're all excited. But I want to go ahead and give you guys as much information as possible so that you can make the correct decisions in week one to start off the season on the right foot. So as we progress throughout today's video, a reminder, if you guys are looking for my thoughts on a specific running back, there are timestamps down in the description. While you're down there, of course, be sure to subscribe. We're making daily fantasy football content for the entirety of the season with a singular goal of trying to help you capture a 2024 fantasy football championship. Now, while you're in the description, for those of you guys who want my all-inclusive rankings for the remainder of the season every single Sunday morning, be sure to check out Underdog Fantasy. At this current moment in time, if you sign up using code Andrew and make a first-time deposit minimum of $10, not only will you be able to claim the first-time deposit offer, not only will you get my 2024 fantasy football draft guide and rankings for those of you who haven't drafted already, but you'll get rankings every single Sunday morning for the remainder of the season all positions, including flex, half PPR, and full PPR. Take advantage of the opportunity based on your current location. You can determine your eligibility if you are not eligible based on your location, or if in fact you've used my code or somebody else's code in the past. You can also check out the Patreon, all that information down in the description. We're offering all this content and much more available there. Thank you very much for all the support. And don't forget, you can start off the 2024 season the right way with a free pick via underdog for Travis Kelsey, 0.5 total yards. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's talk about our top 40 running back rankings. First and foremost, as you approach week one, we don't want to get too cute. We want to start our studs. The players that we utilized high draft capital for are starting going into week one, regardless of matchup. And a lot of the players that I'm about to mention are set it and forget it players. These are guys that regardless of matchup or situation are always going to be in your starting lineup because you drafted them to carry your teams. First and foremost, we begin with Christian McCaffrey in this conversation. In the last 16 regular season games that Christian McCaffrey has played, 14 of them have consisted of him playing 60% of the snaps or more. The only two games in which he wasn't able to do that last season was week 17. Eight minutes left in the third quarter, he stopped playing because, of course, they were up so many points. And there was a game against Cleveland last season in which he got injured and left the game. But in those 14 games, he scored 20 total touchdowns. And in 12 of those 14 games, over 100 total yards accumulated. So 86% of the games that he played at you know a pretty much starter rate, he was able to get himself over 100 yards and a touchdown. This upcoming weekend, the Underdog Fantasy, they do have a potential play of an anytime Christian McCaffrey touchdown. I would take advantage of that if I was you. But of course, we know Christian McCaffrey is not an automatic start, averaging over 20 plus fantasy points per game. Just got to hope he's healthy for week one. Number two, we have Brees Hall. There's no better way to test the New York Jets' new offensive line than taking on the San Francisco 49ers. Really, you bring in four new starters for this offensive line, and they're immediately going to be tested with one of the best defenses in the National Football League and one of the best run-stopping defenses. Even though Brees Hall was able to you know, average himself over 21 touches per game and over 18.5 fantasy points per game from weeks 5 through 18, of last season, the final 13 games of the year, he did find majority of his success within the receiving game. And once he takes on a very difficult run-stopping matchup, the 49ers allowed the second fewest fantasy points in terms of rushing statistics isolated to opposing running backs last season. But luckily for Brees Hall, the receiving upside is always going to be implicated within his weekly production, especially considering last season he was averaging 6.92 targets per game, 5.83 receptions per game, over the course of the last 13 games of the season. He's pretty much game script proofed. And luckily, Aaron Rodgers loves to target his running backs. From 2019 to 2022, he was targeting his running backs 6.74 times per game over the course of those four seasons. So the expectation, of course, is immediate success for Brees Hall in week one. Number three, we have B. John Robinson. Like we have heard all offseason, the new offensive coordinator of the Atlanta Falcons, Zach Robinson, wants to utilize B. John Robinson as the Christian McCaffrey of this offense. If, in fact, he is going to do so, I mean, again, we should find immediate success at a high level. Last season, in games in which B. John Robinson was given 19 or more touches per game, averaging 17.23 half PPR fantasy points per game. Zach Robinson was a member of the, of course, Los Angeles Rams coaching staff last season. They took on the Pittsburgh Steelers, which, of course, is their week one matchup for Atlanta this week. In that game in which the Rams took on the Steelers, of course, Sean McVay called a lot of running plays. Specifically, Daryl Henderson and Royce Freeman were able to collect 30 rushing attempts for 127 yards, one rushing touchdown, a reception for five receiving yards as well for 19.7 fantasy points. If, in fact, Zach Robinson is going to take a couple of the you know, overall schemes that they utilized against the Pittsburgh Steelers last year with the Rams and utilize it within this upcoming week's game, we should see a lot of opportunities for B. John Robinson in week one. The number four to close out the S year is Jonathan Taylor. 
Jonathan Taylor is playing the Houston Texans in week one. The fact of the matter is, the last game of the 2023 season, he took on the Houston Texans. In that game, 30 rushing attempts for 188 rushing yards, one rushing touchdown, two receptions on two targets, and he accumulated a total of 26.6 half PPR fantasy points. Even early last season, in the absence of Jonathan Taylor, in week two, Zach Moss against the Houston Texans as the primary running back of the Indianapolis Colts, 18 carries for 88 yards and a touchdown, four receptions and 19 receiving yards, all for 18.7 fantasy points. So we have gone ahead and witnessed that Shane Steichen, the primary play caller and head coach of the Indianapolis Colts, knows how to take on a D'Amico Ryan's run-stop defense. And he has found success in both of the overall contests within his first year within the matchup. And according to Las Vegas, going into this upcoming weekend, this game is the third highest in terms of potential scoring implicated based on their overall total number. Therefore, we're anticipating a potential shootout on our hands as Jonathan Taylor has himself a lot of opportunity to score fantasy points. Number five, to begin the eight here, we have Saquon Barkley. Again, last season, he did take on the Green Bay Packers, but as a member of the New York Giants, which is definitely a huge difference, especially considering the upgrade that he has now in regards to the teammates that surround him. But this week, they take on the Green Bay Packers in Brazil, which is obviously going to be very weird. Hopefully, there's not going to be a lower scoring game. We're hoping for a shootout. Based on Vegas's overall numbers, it is tied for the third highest potential total points scored. So implication is that there's going to be a lot of scoring within this game and hopefully not so much defense. Last time Saquon Barkley took on the Green Bay Packers last year was with Tommy DeVito as his starting quarterback with the Giants. In that game, Saquon Barkley had 21.6 fantasy points. So now that you put him behind an incredible offensive line, I mean, last season, Saquon Barkley was averaging 6.6 .6 yards per attempt when he was given at very least one yard before contact. So if in fact we're in a situation in which this Eagles offensive line is going to be as dominant as they have continued to be over the course of the last five plus seasons, I mean last season amongst all teams had the third highest number in terms of yards before contact per attempt, 2.7 yards, Saquon Barkley should immediately come out of the gates on fire. Number six, we have Jameer Gibbs. Now for those of you who are concerned regarding his overall hamstring injury, he already returned to practice last week. So he's going to be at a full capacity begin week one. Therefore, we're anticipating a lot of success for him against this Los Angeles Rams defense on Sunday Night Football. A very exciting game. Now, the last time Jameer Gibbs took on this defense was in the playoffs. In that game, eight carries for 25 yards and a rushing touchdown. Four targets, four receptions, 43 yards, and 14.8 half PPR fantasy points while playing 57% of the offensive snaps. Obviously, it wasn't the greatest outing, but in terms of fantasy purposes, had himself great numbers. He was able to find himself a touchdown, and that's something that we saw a lot from Jameer Gibbs at the back end of the year. In fact, Jameer Gibbs, in the last 14 games he has played, has scored a total of 14 touchdowns. So we're anticipating, again, another great game for him this week. He has an improved offensive line, and the biggest difference within the matchup in comparison to the playoff game last year is that there's no Aaron Donald. So this offensive line should have themselves far more success based on implications via Vegas total points. This is supposed to be the highest scoring game of the week, and hopefully... Jameer Gibbs finds himself in the end zone maybe multiple times for our fantasy teams. Number seven, we have Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry was brought into this organization for one reason alone. It is to try to beat the Kansas City Chiefs with Derrick Henry. Because in the NFL playoffs last year, in the AFC Championship game, unfortunately, the Baltimore Ravens floundered in terms of their running game. In that game, they had six rushing attempts from their running backs for 23 yards. Eight targets, five receptions, 50 receiving yards, but only 9.8 fantasy points. Six rushing attempts from their running backs against the Chiefs. So obviously they've gone ahead and decided, hey, we need to bring in Derrick Henry and we need to run the ball because the more that we run the ball, especially against the Chiefs, the more time that Patrick Mahomes is gonna be on the sideline, not impacting the game. Therefore, I'm anticipating a lot of rushing attempts in the direction of Derrick Henry. Sure, the Kansas City Chiefs run stop defense has shown to be a very successful one over the course of the last couple of years, but Derrick Henry is a machine. This is a run first attack. And the fact of the matter is Derrick Henry only gets better over time. As the game progresses, as we get closer to the fourth quarter, his runs become that much more punishing. And of course he can continues to impose his will on the defense. Last season, amongst all teams, the Baltimore Ravens were number one in terms of red zone rushing attempts and number three in terms of total red zone rushing attempts inside the five-yard line. My expectation is one touchdown minimum for Derrick Henry, so if, in fact, Underdog Fantasy's got an anytime touchdown for him, that's something that I'm very interested in going into week one. Number eight, we have Devon A. Chan. Devon A. Chan with a healthy Raheem Moster last season in games in which they played together a was averaging 15.2 fantasy points, even if I exclude the 49-point game 
that he produced against the Denver Broncos. In those games in which they played together, in which they were both healthy, Achan was averaging 14 opportunities per game, which is a total of attempts and targets, while Mostert was averaging 14 and a half. So pretty even numbers across the board. The expectation is that we probably will see even numbers for both these running backs. But the high efficiency of Devon Achan, again, last season averaging 7.77 yards per carry, that high level of efficiency and his home run playmaking ability, being able to make a five yard run to turn into a 50 yard run for a touchdown is what he is all about. Additionally, based on Vegas's overall total points, 49 and a half, this is implicated to be the second highest scoring game of the week, taking on the Jacksonville Jaguars. Typically, the Miami Dolphins are a really high scoring team in the month of September, so we're expecting a shootout down in Miami in week one. Number nine. Speaking of this shootout in Miami, we have Travis Etienne taking on the Miami Dolphins. Again, typically the Miami Dolphins have found themselves a lot of success over the course of the month of September, primarily because of a lot of teams going down to Miami and dealing with the heat, but they're playing against another Florida team. Travis Etienne and the Jacksonville Jaguars are certainly used to the weather down in Florida, so it's not going to bother them. The only thing that worries me going into week one regarding Travis Etienne is the splits that he demonstrated last season in 2023 in regards to winning efforts versus losing efforts. Last season in games in which the Jacksonville Jaguars won, Travis Etienne was averaging 19.13 fantasy points per game. In games in which they lost, 10.15 fantasy points per game. They are three and a half point underdogs against the Miami Dolphins. So hopefully this isn't one of those losing effort numbers going into the given week. But nonetheless, he is starting. He is game script proof primarily because of his receiving upside and hopefully can find himself in the end zone. Number 10, we have Kyron Williams. The only reason Kyron Williams is down here is because he has one of the most difficult matchups amongst all of the elite running backs going into week one. Taking on the Detroit Lions is not a joke. Over the course of the last 31 games, the Detroit Lions have allowed over 100 yards to opposing teams in terms of rushing only three separate times. So when we take that into perspective, Kyron Williams last year averaging 95.3 rushing yards per game, incredible numbers, but understand that this is a very difficult matchup on hand. Against the Detroit Lions last season in the NFL playoffs, only had seven and a half fantasy points scored. So obviously Kyron Williams didn't find himself a lot of success within the matchup. Hopefully going into this week can find himself immediate success. Hopefully find himself in the end zone. Based on the implication, this should be the highest scoring game of week one with a 51 point total. It's just going to be a matter of can the Los Angeles Rams run the ball effectively or are they going to have to air it out against the Detroit Lions secondary, which really hasn't played well over the course of the last couple seasons. Number 11, we have Kenneth Walker, the thumbnail of today's episode. I feel really confident about Kenneth Walker. That is why I made him the thumbnail, primarily because of the matchup on hand. They take on the Denver Broncos amongst all teams in 2023. The Denver Broncos were top five in terms of running back fantasy points allowed based on rushing statistics isolated, allowing 16.08 just off of rushing yards and rushing touchdowns on a per week basis last season. So this is an advantageous matchup going into the given week. Last season between weeks one through 10, we know that Kenneth Walker was averaging nearly 18 touches per game and 14.1 fantasy points per game. And based on Vegas's overall implication, they are the second greatest favorites going into the week. They have the second biggest spread. The Seattle Seahawks are currently minus six favorites. So if in fact, we're assuming Bo Nix, his first rookie game to lead to struggles, there should be a lot of the Seattle Seahawks running the clock and utilizing Kenneth Walker in the second half of this game. Number 12, we have Josh Jacobs to close the RB1 conversation. Josh Jacobs, again, joining the Green Bay Packers. They take on the Philadelphia Eagles in Brazil. Should be a potential shootout. Again, it is the third highest potential total. So the implication is a lot of scoring within this game. Last season, in 2023, the Green Bay Packers were giving their running backs 21.65 rushing attempts per game and 5.53 targets per game. In games last season, in which Josh Jacobs was given 20 or more touches, averaging over 15 and a half fantasy points per game and a half PPR. We know that Marshawn Lloyd was participating in drills on Sunday, should be available for this game this upcoming Friday. But even with Marshawn Lloyd active and potentially getting himself a couple touches, the expectation is that Josh Jacobs should be handling the vast majority, 80 plus percent of the running back targets and attempts out of this backfield and is going to be able to produce himself workhorse level numbers and have himself a fantastic week to begin his Green Bay Packers career. Number 13, we have Isaiah Pacheco. So we know that earlier today that there was a little bit of information regarding Clyde edwards helaire released. He's going to be out for the first four weeks of the season. So Maje P. Ryan is going to have a role within this offense, which certainly does hurt Isaiah Pacheco's receiving upside. And also the fact that they take on the Baltimore Ravens isn't the most exciting matchup. Even though Isaiah Pacheco in the NFL playoffs against the Baltimore Ravens put up 16.2 fantasy points, he had 24 rushing attempts for 68 yards. That's 2.83 yards per carry. Was able to get himself a rushing touchdown, four receptions, 14 receiving yards. Those are great numbers of opportunity, but based on efficiency, not there in both the receiving and rushing categories. 
But what we have seen over the course of weeks 12 through 22 of last season, in games in which Isaiah Pacheco had no Jarek McKinnon in the lineup, again, averaging nearly 22 touches per game and over 17 fantasy points per game. If Samaj P. Ryan is going to be the Jarek McKinnon in this offense, it can't hurt him. We're just going to have to wait and see after week one what the overall contribution of opportunities look like between these two running backs. But nonetheless, we have seen Isaiah Pacheco find success within the matchup before. Why not once again? Number 14, we have James Cook. In the final nine games of last season, he was averaging 20.1 touches per game and nearly 14 fantasy points per game and a half PPR. Now he has an opportunity to start the 2024 year taking on the Arizona Cardinals, which amongst all teams last season, were giving up a lot of fantasy points to opposing running backs in terms of rushing statistics and receiving statistics across the board. We're just getting dominated by opposing running backs. From weeks 10 through 18, the Arizona Cardinals were allowing 25.69 fantasy points per game to opposing running backs on a per game average. Those are ridiculous numbers. Now, the only thing that really does hold back James Cook, despite the fact that he has an incredible matchup, is the fact that Josh Allen still plays on this team. Josh Allen has scored a rushing touchdown in 15 of the last 17 games that he has played. In some of those games, scoring multiple touchdowns. That is always going to be the risk. Therefore, James Cook has to sit at number 14. Number 15, we have Joe Mixon of the Houston Texans. This should be an exciting matchup, like I mentioned earlier with Jonathan Taylor. The implication, based on Vegas, this is tied for the third highest scoring game of the week. So there should be a potential shootout on our hands, and hopefully Joe Mixon can find himself in the end zone. Last season, as a member of the Cincinnati Bengals, he did take on the Indianapolis Colts in that game. 21 carries for 79 yards, a rushing touchdown, three receptions for 46 yards, and 20 fantasy points. Incredible numbers. Last season, in week 18, Devin Singletary, as the starting running back of the Houston Texans, took on the Indianapolis Colts. In that game, 24 carries, 63 yards, and a touchdown, 13 fantasy points. So what we know is that, of course, the Houston Texans want to use their running backs. We witnessed that all of last season. From weeks 9 through 20, Devin Singletary was averaging 18-plus touches per game. So if, in fact, Joe Mixon is going to join this offense and seamlessly become that workhorse back, getting himself a lot of touches isn't out of the question. And, of course, potentially finding the end zone should hopefully be one of the overall outcomes of this game. Number 16, we have Rashad White. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers are taking on the Washington Commanders in week one. The Commanders last season amongst all teams were giving up a lot of fantasy points per game to opposing running backs, over 23 on a per game average. Now they've gone ahead and brought in a new head coach, which is de defensive minded, a new defensive coordinator, and a lot of pieces in terms of revamping that defense as a whole. But the question is, is it enough? Is it enough to stop someone like Rashad White who found himself so much success last season, whether it was on the ground and through the air? A player like Rashad White, in my mind, is very much so matchup proof and honestly game script proof, regardless of whether it's a positive game script or a negative game script, or whether it is a great run stopping defense or a terrible one, he is going to find himself success considering the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have given him so much opportunity last season and going into this year should continue to see a high volume. So based on his overall implicated numbers via underdog fantasy, based on his, you know, pick em slip numbers, he is expected to have 83 and a half potential yards total. So if in fact we add receptions to that, the potential of him finding himself in the end zone, the number 16 overall spot, a safe one in week one. Number 17, we have Alvin Kamara. Alvin Kamara last year in week 14 took on the Carolina Panthers, who he has the privilege of taking on in week one. In that game, 12 carries for 56 yards and a rushing touchdown, only three receptions. Not the greatest overall game, but 12 fantasy points, primarily because he had negative 11 receiving yards. Yeah, not the greatest overall day, but... Going into this week, we're anticipating that Alvin Kamara's numbers in terms of the receiving game should be a lot greater than they were in that game last time he took on the Carolina Panthers, specifically because from weeks 4 through 16 of last year, averaging 6.08 receptions per game and 7.0 targets per game. Now you have Clint Kubiak, the new offensive coordinator, going to utilize Alvin Kamara, hopefully, as the potential Christian McCaffrey of this offense, utilizing you know the correct way. But as we know, Taysom Hill is always going to be the primary threat for Alvin Kamara's overall upside, considering he, he will always have himself opportunities down in the red zone. We're going to have to wait and see how those red zone opportunities break off, who's going to you know gather the vast majority of them. But regarding that subject, time will tell. The only other thing I wanted to mention regarding the matchup is that Clint Kubiak, the new offensive coordinator of the Saints, is very familiar with the defensive coordinator of the Carolina Panthers, uh, Edgero Evero. He was a former defensive coordinator for the Denver Broncos in 2022 when Clint Kubiak was the offensive coordinator of the Broncos that year. Clint Kubiak may have a couple tricks up his sleeve based on his familiarity with the defensive coordinator of the Carolina Panthers. On number 18, we have James Conner to begin the D tier. James Conner is a great running back and the way that he ended the 2023 season makes me think that he can maybe start at that level considering how much opportunity, how much success he was finding. From weeks 13 through 18 of the 2023 season, he was averaging 20.8 attempts 
102.8 rushing yards, one rushing touchdown per game, 0.4 receiving touchdowns per game, three targets, 2.6 receptions, and 26 receiving yards for 22.56 fantasy points per game on average in a half PPR scoring format. Throughout that span of time was the number two overall running back in total points, number one in terms of fantasy points per game on average. Taking on the Buffalo Bills isn't the easiest overall matchup, but the fact of the matter is Matt Milano, the soul of that defense, their primary stud linebacker, is still dealing with an injury. And if that's going to continue to hold him out, it is going to make it that much easier for the Arizona Cardinals to continue to do what they did at the back end of the 2023 year, which is run the ball down defense's throats, regardless of who they're playing. So that is pretty much what I'm anticipating to see this week from James Conner at a full healthy rate. Number 19, we have Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones, the final five games, of his 2023 season, of course, very similar to James Conner, were dominating levels. I mean, 22.6 touches per game, 18.16 fantasy points per game, while playing 66% of the offensive snaps as a Green Bay Packer. Now you go to a new offense. He's fully healthy. And this run game should be utilized heavily, especially in week one, based on all the injuries to the receiving options of the Minnesota Vikings. They're not going to have Jordan Addison potentially and for sure not going to have TJ Hawkinson. So if, in fact, Aaron Jones is asked to run the ball a lot against the New York Giants, don't be surprised, especially considering the New York Giants last season amongst all teams gave up the fourth most points to opposing running backs in terms of rushing statistics, isolated 16.68 per week. The Vikings, over the course of the last couple of years, have taken on the New York Giants on multiple occasions, so Kevin O'Connell is familiar with the matchup. The last two times these teams have taken on each other in the 2022 regular season and 2022 playoffs. In those games, the total points scored between these two teams were 51 and 55. There should be a potential shootout on hand if both these defenses are going to fall asleep and Aaron Jones could have himself a lot of opportunity knocking if, in fact, Aaron Jones is the number two weapon only behind Justin Jefferson. Number 20, we have David Montgomery. David Montgomery has himself an opportunity every single week to score a touchdown. And like I mentioned with Jameer Gibbs, considering the fact that the Detroit Lions have an upgrade at their offensive line, they're taking on the LA Rams that have no Aaron Donald. It should be an easier overall effort. Now, the last time that David Montgomery took on this team in the NFL playoffs, 14 carries for 57 yards, a rushing touchdown, one target, one reception, 11 receiving yards, 13.3 fantasy points and a half PPR on 43% of the offensive snaps. In fact, he outtouched Gibbs in that game 15 to 12. So if we're going to continue to see very similar numbers in terms of David Montgomery last season, with Gibbs at a full rate from weeks 10 through 22, Montgomery being able to get himself 15 touches per game on average, if that's only going to continue, the expectation is that he's always going to have an opportunity for a touchdown, but is also very much so dependent that he falls in the end zone for his fantasy value. Now, speaking of fantasy value being determined by rushing touchdown upside, we have Raheem Moser, who of course scored 20 plus touchdowns last year, who has an opportunity in week one to get himself a bunch of touches. Like I mentioned earlier with Devon Achan, last season in games in which they were both healthy, Devon Achan was getting himself 14 opportunities per game, and Raheem Mostert was getting himself 14 and a half. Throughout those games, Mostert was averaging 13.62 fantasy points per game. That excludes the Denver Broncos game. So again, a lot of points were excluded, but still, when we're finding the potential averages, you know, not the outliers in these overall situation, Raheem Mostert still should be considered a top 24 option going into the given week, especially considering this is the second highest uh, scoring game implicated based on Vegas's overall spread. The expectation based on the total number is that we should have a shootout, and what we have heard earlier today from Mike McDaniel, in terms of his overall press conference, he was asked about the running backs. He is very much so on the, I'm going to give the running back the ball who has the hottest hand. And if Raheem Mostert finds himself success early in the game, which he will considering his efficiency, it's going to continue to just lead to more and more touches. Number 22, we have Jerome Ford. Like I mentioned all offseason, Jerome Ford is going to be a guy that immediately is going to find success for the first I'd say six weeks of the season at a full rate. And then henceforth after that, once we see what the deal with Nick Chubb is, we'll adjust his overall rankings accordingly. But going into week one against the Dallas Cowboys, we have to remember that Jerome Ford, you know, got himself a lot of opportunity and he's going to continue to get it regardless of the matchup. Last season from weeks one through 17 was averaging 15.2 touches per game and 12.92 fantasy points per game. Was able to get himself on average about three receptions per game. Now, what the biggest difference is from... All of the different offenses we saw with the Cleveland Browns last year, whether it was with Deshaun Watson, DTR, P.J. Walker, Joe Flacco, is that the primary differences between a Joe Flacco offense and Deshaun Watson offense is the amount of rushing attempts versus passing attempts. Last season, in the, in the five games in which Joe Flacco played, they were averaging 41 passing attempts per game and 23 rushing attempts per game. In the five games in which Deshaun Watson played at a full healthy rate, only 33 passing attempts per game, but 29 rushing attempts per game. So Jerome Ford should have himself a lot of opportunity within this matchup. And do not be surprised if Pierre Strong, the potential Kareem Hunt of this offense starting week one, 
is going to be getting himself potentially 10 touches within a given week. Could be a decent waiver wire pickup before week one begins. Number 23, we have Zamir White. The last time he took on the Los Angeles Chargers was within week 15 of last year. In that game, 17 carries for 69 yards, a rushing touchdown, three receptions, 16 receiving yards, 16.0 fantasy points. What we heard just a couple days ago from the head coach of this team, Antonio Pierce, who has been adamant and has said in the past that he wants to give his primary running back 20 plus touches per game. He said regarding Zamir White, he is bigger, stronger, and more explosive this season. And on the early downs this year, we're going to see a lot of number three. And that's what we anticipate to see a lot of number three within the matchup against the Los Angeles Chargers. Based on Vegas implications, the Chargers are only minus three point favorites. So this should be a close game and potentially a lot of rushing attempts for both these teams and finding themselves a lot of success with their primary running back. Samir White hopefully will also get himself some receiving upside within the game. Number 24, we have Javante Williams. In 2023, this backfield was a running back by committee. With Javante, Samaj Piran, and Jaleel McLaughlin, we really didn't know who was going to get the vast majority of touches, who was going to get the goal line touches, who was going to be the third down back. But going into 2024, we have a far clearer picture. I mean, last year, this offense was able to give their running backs on a per-game average 20.35 attempts per game and 8.82 targets per game. Now, with the absence of Samaj Piran, there are so many opportunities up for grabs for a guy like Javante Williams to be able to take advantage of. And considering he's another year removed from the ACL injury, this team should feel far more confident in terms of giving him a higher volume of touches, taking on, taking on the Seattle Seahawks. What we also know within the matchup is, of course, they are considered to be underdogs by a pretty big, big rate. If, in fact, there's going to be a lot of passing within this game, Javante Williams should find himself a lot of success within the receiving upside. We know that the nickname for Bo Nix coming out of Oregon was Bubble Screen Bo. 28% of his overall passes in his final year at Oregon consisted of passes behind the line of scrimmage. So if in fact, we're going to see a lot of attempts towards the running back position, Javante Williams should be able to succeed in that regard. Number 25, we have DeAndre Swift. With a new offensive coordinator and a new team taking on the Tennessee Titans, the question is how are the Chicago Bears going to find themselves immediate success come week one and be able to just kind of seamlessly transition Caleb Williams from the college game to the NFL. And I think that is going to exist within the running game. Once you can establish a great running game that Shane Waldron really likes to do and has proven to be able to continue to give his primary RB1 a high volume of touches, that RB1 over the course of the last two years being Kenneth Walker, considering he has given his primary RB1 in the past a lot of touches, the expectation is that DeAndre Swift coming out of the gate should find himself a lot of opportunities on the ground so that it opens up more play action for Caleb Williams and makes his life easier. The secondary of the Tennessee Titans have been completely revamped and the new defensive coordinator of the Tennessee Titans, is a former DBs coach for the Baltimore Ravens. So there is going to be a lot of emphasis in terms of stopping the pass against Caleb Williams, and hopefully it'll open up more opportunities to run the ball with a guy like DeAndre Swift getting himself the vast majority of touches out of this backfield, and of course, hopefully having himself even more upside within the receiving game. Number 26, we have Ramondre Stevenson. Speaking of having upside within the receiving game, regardless of game script, Ramondre Stevenson is going to be in this game. Now going into this week, the Patriots are plus eight and a half point favorites the biggest underdogs within the given week so if in fact we're going to see the cincinnati Bengals come out take a massive lead Ramondre stevenson should be implicated for a lot of receiving work within the overall second half of this game in order to come back but early on in the game is going to be given opportunities in the rushing game he's going to find himself success and like he was able to do last season for mix one through 12 averaging 16.72 touches per game and 11.3 fantasy points per game we know that Alex Van Pelt taking on the Cincinnati Bengals. He is very much so familiar with the matchup, primarily because Alex Van Pelt is a former offensive coordinator of the Cleveland Browns. They took on the Cincinnati Bengals twice last year. So with the overall familiarity within the matchup, should be able to find success within the running game. Number 27, we have Najee Harris. Arthur Smith, their current offensive coordinator, new offensive coordinator, is the former head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. This is a revenge game of sorts. But the biggest thing that worries me regarding Najee Harris is his overall production in winning efforts versus losing efforts. This upcoming week, they are underdogs against the Atlanta Falcons. So if, in fact, we are in a situation in which this is going to lead to a losing effort, last season, Najee Harris in losing efforts, only averaging 6.21 fantasy points per game. In games that led to winning efforts, averaging 13.75 fantasy points per game. That is what concerns me. This defense has made a lot of you know effort to bring in new defenders, bring in Raheem Morris to be able to bolster this run-stopping defense that was already great last season. Najee Harris is going to have his hands full with the overall matchup. Number 28, we have Chuba Hubbard, who in my opinion, again, in the absence of Jonathan Brooks, is going to find himself a lot of value. Now, last season in week 14, he took on the New Orleans Saints. He has the privilege of taking them on in week one here. In that game, put up 10.6 fantasy points with a total of 92 yards. That's a total of rushing and receiving. 
So within the overall matchup, with Dave Canales now as the primary play caller, Dave Canales, of course, the OC of Tampa Bay last year, very familiar with the New Orleans Saints defense, very familiar with the overall matchup. Last season, in the two games in which the Tampa Bay Buccaneers took on the New Orleans Saints, Dave Canales ran the ball 38 times for 133 rushing yards, only a 3.5 yard per carry average, but also targeted his running backs 14 times for 13 receptions and 89 receiving yards. So the expectation is that, of course, we should see somewhere between 20 to 25 potential touches in the favor of Chuba Hubbard and Miles Sanders. Chuba Hubbard obviously getting himself the vast majority of those and be able to find himself a lot of success in terms of yardage. And hopefully he's able to find himself in the end zone, but I wouldn't count on it. Number 29, we have Gus Edwards. Takes on the Las Vegas Raiders in a game like I mentioned earlier, which is expected to be a closer scoring contest between these two teams. Considering all the efforts that the Los Angeles Chargers have made in terms of making themselves a clear and away running team, whether it's bringing in offensive linemen, you know, obviously drafting Joe Alt with your first round pick and being able to bolster this offensive line, then also bringing in run blocking tight ends in Hayden Hurst and Will Disley, then bringing in running backs of the caliber of J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards. Gus Edwards is the primary number one. And when you have Greg Roman as your offensive coordinator, a former offensive coordinator of the Baltimore Ravens when Gus Edwards was there, under Greg Roman, Gus Edwards has averaged 5.24, 5.35, 5.02, and 4.98 yards per carry in the last four seasons he has played under Greg Roman. The expectation is a lot of carries, efficiency, and for Gus Edwards' sake, hopefully him finding himself in the end zone considering the receiving upside isn't within the conversation. Number 30, we have Zach Moss. And number 31, I want to also talk about Chase Brown. Let's talk about both these running backs going into week one, primarily because their potential for upside is quite identical, to be honest. We don't know what the backfield split is going to be going into week one in terms of total touches, utilization, etc., but we do know that they have quite literally one of the best matchups within the given week taking on the New England Patriots. Primarily because based on Vegas's overall number, they are the biggest favorites going into the given week. And if in fact we're going to see a lot of running within the second half of this game, Zach Moss and Chase Brown should be implicated to get themselves a lot of overall touches. Now what happened late last season within the Bengals offense in the absence of Joe Burrow was a lot of rushing attempts. From weeks 13 through 18, 23 rushing attempts per game and six targets per game to their respective running backs. So that's 29 opportunities per game. So if in fact, Zach Moss, Chase Brown can get themselves 14 to 15 opportunities within the given week, taking on the New England Patriots in a game which should be a positive game script, running the ball for majority of the second half. We should see, of course, both these running backs find themselves immediate success within week one and potentially be flexible options within the week. Number 32, we have Brian Robinson Jr. Brian Robinson Jr. very much so similar to guys like Gus Edwards, or potentially Zamir White, David Montgomery, is that they are heavily reliant on touchdowns because the receiving game isn't going to be as implicated within their overall upside. And in you know Brian Robinson Jr.'s case, that's primarily because of Austin Eckler. And we should see a lot of Austin Eckler, especially if, in fact, we're going to have a negative game script on hand. The only reason I think that there's a possibility in which that takes place is because the Buccaneers, over the last couple of years, have been great in terms of stopping opposing running backs. In fact, amongst all teams in 2023, they allowed the fewest rushing touchdowns to opposing running backs with only five throughout their 17 games. Now, if this is going to happen and Brian Robinson Jr. is going to have to be heavily reliant on, of course, rushing yardage and receiving utilization, he may still be in luck, primarily because the last time Cliff Kingsbury, who is the current OC of the Washington Commanders, took on a Todd Bowles defense, who is currently the, you know, head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, a defensive-minded coach. But the last time they took each other on, 2022, when Cliff Kingsbury was the head coach of the Cardinals, week 16 against Tampa Bay, his running backs, 16 carries for 81 yards and a touchdown, eight targets, seven receptions, 41 receiving yards, 21.7 fantasy points. There is a possibility that both Brian Robinson Jr. and, of course, Austin Eckler can coexist and find themselves success here. It's just a matter of how good is this Washington Commanders offense come week one. Number 33, we have Tony Pollard. The only issue that I have with Tony Pollard is that he has a terrible matchup. It really is going to be difficult. Amongst all teams in terms of run-stopping defense, the Chicago Bears were sixth in terms of DVOA last season. They were also giving up the third fewest fantasy points per game in terms of rushing statistics to opposing running backs last year. The check down game is going to be vital for the overall success of Tony Pollard. Luckily, from weeks 8 through 15 of last year, Will Levis was targeting his running backs seven times per game on average when he was a starting quarterback and healthy. So that is going to save Tony Pollard. He's cleared away the number one running back, so he's going to get the vast majority of rushing attempts. And he certainly has the ability to make a two-yard run turn into a 20-yard run. But this matchup against the Chicago Bears, it is no joke. They really are one of the best run-stopping defenses in the league. Number 34, we have Devin Singletary. 
Devin Singletary, like I mentioned earlier with Joe Mixon, late last season was getting himself a lot of opportunities as the primary back of the Houston Texans. 18.4 touches per game, 12.2 fantasy points per game in the final 12 games of the year. Now, in the last two games in which the New York Giants have taken on the Minnesota Vikings, in 2022, both in the one in the regular season, one in the playoffs. The running back opportunities within those games, 27 and 18. Now, those were with Saquon Barkley. If, in fact, we even get close to those numbers and Devin Singletary could potentially handle another 18 touches, he could very easily outproduce the number 34 spot. The only issue is the New York Giants aren't even expected to win this game, and they're at home. They're one of only two teams going into week one who are home underdogs, which, again, doesn't bode well for their potential this upcoming week especially if, in fact, this offense cannot move the ball early in the game and they're going to be in a negative game script. Sure, Devin Singletary will benefit from the receiving upside, but so will Tyrone Tracy, and that could impede his overall upside for success. But hopefully, they're able to find themselves success on the ground and give Devin Singletary the proper opportunities he deserves as the primary back of this team. Number 35, we have Austin Eckler. Like I mentioned earlier, we do anticipate to see a potential for a negative game script against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Again, they played well last season and should be the better team against the Washington Commanders. Unless this Commanders team has made a huge improvement this offseason with all the addition they have made, we should expect to see a negative game script, which, of course, that leads to a lot of Austin Eckler receiving work. On top of the fact that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have allowed the fewest rushing touchdowns amongst all teams to opposing running backs last season, it bodes very well for an Austin Eckler-type game. So with Cliff Kingsbury and what we know from him and the way that he has utilized his number two RB in the past, He's going to get a lot of receiving utilization out of Austin Eckler and potentially a couple rushing attempts here and there. Number 36, we have Jalen Warren. Again, another one of these third down backs that comes in and gets themselves a lot of success. Last season, in 14 of the 17 games he played, was able to get himself three or more receptions. If that's going to continue to be the case, on top of that, if he's going to be healthy for week one, obviously he's still recovering from the hamstring injury, the expectation is that he's going to play. And if he does, it may be at a more limited role in comparison to what it normally is, considering they're trying to kind of ease him back from that hamstring and not force a potential re-aggravation for it. Number 37, we have Ty J. Spears. Ty J. Spears in a very similar boat as Tony Pollard, unfortunately, primarily because this is a very good run-stopping defense, sixth best in terms of DVOA, and allowed the third fewest fantasy points to opposing running backs based on rushing statistics. But in terms of receiving statistics, this could be a game in which both Ty J. Spears and Tony Pollard find themselves a lot of success within the receiving game. Therefore, they're both going to be in this number 33 to 37 range because if they're able to get themselves four or five receptions for 40, 50 receiving yards, fantastic. But the rushing upside is not going to be as implicated. Therefore, their potential for success in terms of getting themselves a rushing touchdown, not as likely as we'd like it to be. Number 38 slash number 39, we have both of the running backs of the Dallas Cowboys. Very similar to when I talked about Zach Moss and Chase Brown. We're not exactly sure how this is going to break down, but we do know that they're going to run the ball. We've heard a lot of reports as to whether or not Rico Dattle is going to be the number one or if it's going to be Zeke based on his experience with this you know, offense. The report he has already built with Dak Prescott over the years in his career. We're going to have to wait and see, but they do take on the Cleveland Browns, which is a great defense, but one that has struggled at times in terms of stopping the run. We're going to have to wait and see if this Dallas Cowboys offensive line with the changes they have made this offseason is going to be good enough to move the chains within the running game. The final running back I wanted to mention is Julio McLaughlin. Like I mentioned earlier, the Denver Broncos are the second biggest underdog going into the week against the Seattle Seahawks. The expectation should be a lot of passing. And like I mentioned with Javante Williams, Bo Nix out of college, out of Oregon in his final year, about what 28% of his passes were behind the line of scrimmage. He's known as bubble screen Bo. The expectation is that there should be a lot of potential dump offs to a guy like Jaleel McLaughlin. All right, guys, that's going to cover it for my week one running back rankings for the 2024 fantasy football season. If you enjoyed today's content, subscribe, click the like button down below. And of course, if you want my all-inclusive rankings for the remainder of the season, check out Underdog Fantasy or check out the Patreon. All that information down in the description. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I'll be back with wide receiver rankings tomorrow. And until next time, I'll see you guys. Peace. Peace.